Okay, guys. So we have a brand new class today. Thank God, Bo Hashem. We're starting Lakute Halachot again. It's been probably about a year at this point. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick um, review about what we've done in the past so that way you understand where we're at now because we're in the middle of a section. Rav Natan is beautifully describing how we left Mitzrayim and how the essence of leaving Mitzrayim is a Muna. We know that this was Rabbi Nachman's big calling card. That this is what he was trying to hammer home in us constantly. That his whole mission was tefillah, like he said, and tefillah is a Muna. And Muna means above nature. It means it's not constricted. It's not limited to the natural world. It's something that's above this world. And this is the key to leaving Mitzrayim. And Rav Natan is amazingly, like he often does, going through the entire story of us leaving Mitzrayim, the whole account of it, and showing how each part of it is really a pouring out of that phenomenon. That Amuna is what allows them to be lifted up and out in the way that it was. And why is that important to us? Because we have a mitzvah from the Torah that every single day, we should remember that we left Mitzrayim. And Rabbi Nachman actually says that each day we should know that we're still leaving Mitzrayim. So how does that make sense? Because you're in America and I'm in Israel. So how are we leaving Mitzrayim? So the answer is that Mitzrayim is a code word in the Torah for all suffering. All suffering is called Mitzrayim, whether it's spiritual suffering or physical suffering, psychological suffering, emotional suffering, all of these different types of suffering or pain, all of this is called Mitzrayim according to the Torah. And the exile of the Jewish people in physical Mitzrayim was actually only a reflection of the slavery of their neshamot. It was the slavery and the servitude of their true selves, which was brought down into exile in Mitzrayim, which Rabbi Nachman says was a place of teva, it was a place of nature, it was a place of science only. They had no faith there. Because Teva is, an, is, is the antithesis of Amuna. And obviously, we can actually resonate with this tremendously. And it makes a lot of sense. The Midrash that says that just like we left Mitzrayim, we're going to leave our final exile with the Mashiach. So how could this be anything like that? However, we know that the predominant thought process in the world is that of science. And we even see now with COVID, obviously, which has been a very, very delicate and very um, difficult situation for so many people across the world for the past couple of years. And obviously when it comes to what's the most uh, responsible way to combat the virus, what should you do? What shouldn't you be doing? Should you take the shot? Is the shot dangerous? If you don't take the shot, um, you get killed by the secular world. If you do take the shot, maybe you're putting yourself at risk for X, Y, and Z. I don't know um, the answer to any of these things. But all I would tell you uh, is what Rabbi Nachman says. And that is that you should stay as far away from doctors as possible. So <laughs> how does that make sense of what we're going through? So one of the reasons is a very deep psychological point. That is that a doctor's whole investment is in the medical community and it's in the scientific method. That scientific method, while it's been one of tremendous physical progress for us in the world, it's also been one of tremendous spiritual decline. And therefore, Rabbi Nachman said that just like this Parsha Noach that's coming up, and Bezut Hashem is going to be writing about this. So, anybody who has not yet subscribed your email yet for the newsletter, you should really do it because the articles are amazing. And we just started last week. and and these articles as well this week should be really beautiful and important. So one of Rabbi Nachman's famous sikhas from Sikhat Aran, which is constantly um, spoken about, is that he said that there's a flood coming. And it wasn't the flood of Noah that wiped out people. It's the flood of atheism. And while these two things seem very separate, and very different, the truth is that Rabbi Nachman says only a person who believes in Hashem is really called Adam. He's really called alive. He's called human. So if you have the majority of the world that they've never heard of Hashem, that there's this concealment within a concealment, 
that not only is Hashem hidden from us, but He's so hidden that you don't even notice that that's a problem. You don't even notice that there's a lacking in your life from it. That's how doubly concealed He is. And what's the main reason for that concealment? Rabbi Nachman says, Teva, nature. And this is something which is very hard to grapple with because we know that the majority of the world feels that Teva or science is the most cutting edge thing that we have. It's the most progressive thing that we have. It's where we can put all of our hope for the present and the future. And at the same time, the Tzaddik, Rabbi Nachman, is saying that it's the opposite. That in fact, Teva is the cause of all suffering in the world. Teva is the cause of all constriction. It's the cause of atheism. And, and, and that's very hard to hold both those things at the same time. And it makes sense why Rabbi Nachman says that the war, the, the war of Gog and Magog that the Gemara speaks about, that final war before the coming of Mashiach, uh, is not a physical one. It is one of philosophy. It's one of belief about life. That on one side, you're going to have a very small group of people that they believe Hashem runs the world. And they believe that everything is according to Hashem's hashkacha, His providence. And on the other side, you're going to have the majority of the world saying that those people are insane and that they are ancient and that they have not made progress. And they think that if only for those people, if they would just come with us, then we would really be able to fix the world. Uh, and in fact, this is, the, uh, this is the greatest conflict of all time. And it's so deep and it's so hidden and it's so subtle. And I was on the other side. So I, I know what it's like, and I know how deeply those people believe what they believe, maybe as much as we believe what we believe. So that's why Goga Magog is so scary, because you have two groups of people who truly, truly believe in their hearts what they're saying. And that's why you need the tzaddik. That's why you need Rabbi Nachman, because he says that only he, the tzaddik, has a pure da'at. He has clear consciousness. He has not been altered or transformed by secular wisdom, by taivas, by desires for the physical world, desires for money or desires for sex. He's not um, traumatized by modern society. And because of that, he can look clearly and see the truth. We, Rabbi Nachman says, that we are powers of imagination have been tarnished and they've been blemished. And therefore, whenever we see anything in the world, it's not coming with pure sight. It's not coming with clear vision. And therefore, we really need to rely on the tzaddik. We really need to rely on that pure consciousness to be able to get us out of this place. Because on paper, it's hard not to agree with the secular world when you see all the evidence that science comes out with. If you really look at those things, you know, how do you not go with them? It does reek of ignorance. But all of a sudden, you have a person who's saying, actually, against the whole world, you're going to have to be very strong and you're going to have to be very courageous because he says explicitly at the end of days, there's going to be a very small group of people that have a Muna and a Shem. And those people need to hold on very, very, very tight. And he says it's going to be a very precarious situation. And that's what we're in right now. You know, this is a very crazy time with COVID and just the world. It feels like it's been halted. It's been stopped. Um, it feels like religious people think it's the end of the world, obviously. But it also feels like secular people think it's the end of the world. So something's happening right now. And comes Rav Natan to teach us what the Tzaddik says. And this we need to hold on to and we need to bring into our hearts because this is the key out of here. It says in Masechet Pasachim in the beginning of the Gemara of Pesach. 
that on the 14th, you need to check your home for chametz. And it points out there, Vekarei Atana Laor to Or. Why do you need to say that you need to check with Or? Just say you need to check. Why do you need to check with light, with Or? It says there, Lishna Ma'alya. It's an elevated language. Rav Natan now teaches us the secret of this. That the essence of that search that takes place before you leave Mitzrayim, before we leave collective Mitzrayim, before we leave our personal suffering, you first need to make sure that you check for any chametz in your house and you need to destroy and burn all of it. And he says, what's the essence of that chametz that we need to destroy, which is really the key to the whole ge'ula. It's not just like you have chametz and you have this one step, you need to remove it. And then all of a sudden the next day we happen to be redeemed. It's that the burning of the chametz itself was the natural outpouring of that became redemption. It became ge'ula. And this is why, according to the Hasidim, they go to such crazy extent to make sure they don't have chametz. And even though it might not even be api alacha, why are they going to such crazy length? Because the Arizal says, if you have no chametz in your house at all, you'll never come to an Avera the whole year. And obviously Avera to the cause for concealment of godliness in our life, whether they're on purpose or it's an accident, whether it's intentional or it's with the best intentions uh, that you could possibly have. And so we learn from our sages, we have to get rid of this chametz completely. Now on paper, it's hard to understand why is it so important? I have to get rid of bread. I have to get rid of rising bread. And they have those beautiful uh, chazals because the rising bread represents arrogance. It's like uh, elevated, it's lifted, it's too much. But Rabbi Nachman comes and he clarifies this in such a deep and such a simple way. That the whole essence of chametz is secular wisdom. That just like chametz rises, just like leaven causes bread to rise, so too your mind is compared to bread. That's why it says uh, many times in Chazal that bread is the food of consciousness. That a child can't say Abba or Ima until he eats bread. That the Zohar says that our world is the only world of all the spiritual uh, worlds in conjunction to our physical world. That we're the only ones who eat bread. Nobody else eats bread. And that's why we have intelligence in this world. And the Zohar says that people, they throw away crumbs of bread. And that it brings to poverty. Now we know that the Gemara says that there's no poverty like a poverty of Da'at. A poverty of consciousness. So we see that the Zohar is hinting to this fact that these bread crumbs are really something much deeper than physical bread but they represent a state of mind. And that state of mind is deeply, deeply affected by chametz. To the extent that Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Natan are now bringing that our whole exile is because of chametz, even now. And if we're suffering now, it's because we have chametz in our mind. What's the chametz in our mind? Teva, nature. Shehu b'chinat chametz. Shin uch shenit patel, ha-teva, and when a person he nullifies this teva and as a result reveals hashkacha, this is what nullifies the darkness of the night. That the strength of all exile for 2,000 years and our personal exiles, it's all rooted in the wisdom of nature, of science. Because like that when is revealed the hashkach of Hashem Yiparach, in this world, azai ein shum choshech klav, then there's no such thing as darkness in the world. Keikara or, because the essence of the or, hu Hashem Yiparach kivachum. The essence of the light itself is Hashem. Why do we need to check with a light to make sure there's no chametz in our house? Because the light is Hashem Himself. And what do we need to sniff out? We need to sniff out anything which contradicts His reality. And specifically the reality that He's Machadish. That He renews and He can change and transform anything at any given moment if He wants to. 
Where is that most directly rejected by? Science. And the underlying thought process of the scientist is, well, if I see it, I'll believe it. And I don't see God, but I see what I have with my five senses. But the very tricky part of this equation is that on the other side, Rabbi Nachman teaches spiritually, only when you believe it, you'll see it. So on paper, they're not wrong. But the Torah is also not wrong. And you have these two realities that are existing codependently. You have on the one side the physical world, the reality of nature, which is real, which exists. And then you have the Torah, which is teaching you, but only if you believe in it. And if you don't, then you're not held by those laws of nature. Like when Abraham couldn't have children, which was not just physical children. He wasn't able to give birth to the purpose of his life. He wasn't going to be able to give birth to Da'at in the world, consciousness of Hashem. And Hashem said to him, look up. Look up. And the Midrash says that he took him out of the physical world. When he told him to look up at the stars, he was telling him, look up, get out, out of your box. Move out of Teva and see that in truth, you're way beyond this. You have to look up. Like we say at night, from where is my help going to come from? Me'ayin. Look up, it says. Lift your eyes up. That's where your help's going to come from. Because we all know too well how much science has failed us, how much nature has failed us. And I know this is very controversial. And if any of my friends growing up sees this, I'm going to get torched. But when I was depressed, the therapists were not helping me and the psychiatrists were not helping me and the cutting edge technology that was supposed to be healing was hurting. me. And the underlying thought of it is that I'm doomed. I'm always going to be depressed because I have a genetic disability. I have a genetic issue. And this genetic issue is never going to go away. I can only cope with such a thing. And it's true. According to Teva, they are right. But Rabbi Nachman says, but who says that you're bound to that? Who says that you're bound to Teva, to nature? Why don't you lift yourself up and out? And all you have to do is believe in Hashem. And as soon as you believe in Hashem, automatically Teva becomes nullified. Nature becomes nullified for you. And Hashem performs miracles. Like we just said. And therefore night will be like the day. That also the darkness won't darken from you anymore. And the Laila Kiyom Yair. And the night is going to shine like the day. Like darkness, like light. Because the essence of darkness is concealment of godliness in our life. And the essence of light is revelation of godliness in our life. And Rabbi Nachman is teaching us such a fundamental, such a deep point that we need to internalize. Darkness is the product of some type of wisdom. Because wisdom creates everything in the world. Consciousness creates reality. Belief creates reality. Rav Natan has told us so many times over what Rabbi Nachman says in an abstract way. Rav Natan brings and he smashes it into your heart. When you believe in nature, all you have is nature. And good luck. But when you believe in Hashem, it's light. There's clarity. Because now anything is possible. And ain't shum yeosh ba'olam klal. There's no such thing as despair in the world. But that's only in a world of amuna, In a world of nature, you have so much to despair of. You have so much to be worried about. You could just hear it in the music. Just go listen to Jewish music versus secular music. Jewish music, it might not be so high quality. We might not have reached the quality yet technologically of the secular world. But if you listen to Jewish music, it's so hopeful and it's so innocent. And if you listen to secular music, it's so dark and it's so scary. And it's coming from belief systems. One believes in Teva, and therefore everything in the world becomes scary. Everything becomes unhinged. Everything is troublesome. Everything is worrisome. But in a world of Amuna, in a world of closeness to Hashem, that even in that same broken, fissured world, you have light and you have love and you have peace. 
and you have unity and you have hope. Because your consciousness is wherever your mind is. It's not what the physical world looks like. The secular world tells you that you're a slave to the world. Your mind needs to be stuck in the gutter of this physical world. And the Torah says, lift your eyes up, lift your head up, lift your mind up, lift your heart up. Because it doesn't have to be in the physical place you're living in. You're not a slave to the world. The world needs to be a slave to you. Like it's going to be in the future. That it'll be at that time, the night will be like day. Like we pray for on Pesach. Should illuminate like the light of the day, the darkness of the night. Because the essence of the darkness of night that is only coming from belief in the wisdom of Teva, of nature, of science. That that's all that there is, that's all that there can be, that there's nothing outside of it. Shem ikar choshach, that's the essence of darkness. This is what the Greeks brought to the world. That when they came to the world and they thought that they were bringing light with their elevated wisdom and abstract philosophy. The Torah says clearly what they brought was darkness. In the first parsha of the Torah, we have four expressions of darkness there's tohu there's vohu there's darkness in the world and each of these expressions of darkness the torah says is connected to a different galu to a different exile which is the one that's connected to the greeks which is obviously what was their chiddish it was philosophy it was teva that this is all that there is and the torah and chazal say that was hoshech that was darkness but the Greeks thought Adra, but it's the opposite. The Jews are the last remaining vestige of morality. They're the last remaining vestige of imagination. That there's such a thing as God and that God is the all-encompassing uh, uh, existence in the world. And we're not bound to Teva. We're not bound to nature. We don't have to be ignorant anymore. We can grow. We can believe. And at the same time, what were those Greeks doing? They were constantly immersed in sexual deviance. Everything about the culture was permissive and naked. And we see even now that as science increases, as progress is made in the natural world, you also see an increase in permissiveness. You also see an increase in nakedness because they go together. You'll notice that Adam and Chava, before they ate from the tree, they ate to Da'ad Tovara. They didn't even know that they were naked. And they didn't care. It wasn't appealing to them. It wasn't, uh, you know, this is the next thing that I want to see. They had much bigger goals. They had much loftier dreams. And when they ate from the ate to Da'ad Tovara, which Rav Natan explains, is really the tree of Teva, immediately they realized that they were naked. And Rav Nachman is teaching us that these things go hand in hand. That atheism and Pagama Brit go one and one with the other. And therefore, the source of all darkness in the world and in our personal lives, in our families' lives, in society's life, is that of which is considered to be the highest, greatest thing in the secular world. Science, Teva, and our investment in it. And therefore, it's at night time that we need to search for chametz, because it's mamish in the darkness itself, it's in the concealment itself, that we need to go find that chametz. We need to go find our investment in our heart and nature. And if you're suffering and you don't think you have it, you need to go check again, because there is no suffering in this world without a belief in teva without a belief in nature, because that's the belief that causes jayus. That's the belief that causes despair. The person who he goes to the gym and he's working out and his muscles are physically ripping. He's not sad. He's not angry. He's not confused. He's excited. He's hopeful. He's happy, but he's suffering, but he's not. How is that possible? Because he knows that this is going to lead to good. We are supposed to be like that all the time. That no matter how much our muscles are ripping, no matter how much we're being torqued and twisted in our lives, we need to know it's giving birth to a greater good. And just like the athlete, just like the wrestler, just like the workout warrior, 
we can actually be happy in the midst of it because we know it's for the best, but that's only when you have a Muna. Because as long as you don't have a Muna and your belief is in Teva, then you're not going to believe it's for the best. And your eyes are going to be down here. They're not going to be up. They're not going to be invested in hope and change. They're going to be invested in static science, that it's the same. It's always the same. And it's an unbelievable thing. It's really, really, uh, it's, it's Pele, it's wondrous. That with every advancement in science, with the intention of trying to give us more hope, it's t- been taken away more and more from a person. That you never have higher rates of suicide, of drug abuse, of therapy. Where is all this Jehush coming from? Rabbi Nachman says it's coming from our belief in the very thing that we think is saving us, Teva. It's putting us to sleep. It's not waking us up. Torah, Tana. Therefore, the Tana says, or mamish. You need to search with or. Lishna ma'aya. This elevated language. Al shem bitla teva. Because it's only the light of Hashem, meaning a muna, that can nullify teva for a person. Shubachinat a chametz. Shabodkin bato laila. This is the concept of chametz, that you're searching for it in the midst of the night in the concealment of godliness, and the chastar shebetoh chastar, the concealment within the concealment. That it's through this, the light itself transforms. The night transforms to light. The night becomes light. The concealment becomes revelation. Because in truth, the light and the day are not different. That like it says the Zohar about Adam Rishon in last week's Parsha, that it says that Adam was kicked out of the garden. And that's the Pashta Pasha, that's the simple understanding. But the Zohar has such a deep, deep, deep exposition of this and insight into this, where it says that in fact, you can read that same Pasuk and learn it out differently. Adam wasn't kicked out of the garden. Hashem was kicked out of the garden. That would change Adam's reality from one of Gan Eden, one of hope, one of light, one of consciousness, one of clarity to one of darkness and fear and anxiety and suffering was actually that Hashem was taken out of the garden because he ate from the tree, because he tasted from secular wisdom, because he invested his heart and his soul into something which is foreign to a Jewish person, that of Teva. But if we can nullify Teva in our life, if we can find the chametz in our heart, Rabbi Nachman says you could be back in Gan Eden because you're going to bring Hashem back into your life. And not only that, then you don't even have to be removed from your terrible situation. Your terrible situation will be shown to be light itself, that the revelation of God is already there for the taking. It only looks like darkness because of your investment in nature. Therefore, he says, it's the light of night. You need to check at the light of night. Where is there light in night? There's no light in night. Unless you have a Muna. And with a Muna, the night becomes light. Bezrat Hashem, we should all have the schut. We should all have the help from Hashem that we really need now. That in the midst of a world which will torch you, if you believe in anything besides Teva, or anything that's above Teva, anything that goes beyond the five senses, and you can literally be made to feel like you're a pariah, like you're the worst human being in the world, for feeling like there's something more going on. You need to hold on so strong. You need to mamish hold on to your Muna with such simplicity, with such innocence, like Noah, that he walked with Hashem with Tamimus. Because when everybody came to him and he's building that ark, they say, what are you doing, Mapiton? You're crazy. Go get a job. Go do something normal. Why every day you're building this ark? He said, because I need this ark, because it's about to flood. Because there's a darkness that's coming into the world right now. And I need to be active and protect myself from it. And while you think I'm being ignorant, Hashem thinks I'm being as wise as humanly possible. And we need to have that same inner conviction that even when the whole world says that we're insane, we need to hold true to our belief. That belief that was given to us from our forefathers the one that is residing in the heart of every single Jew, which nature has taken from us, which Teva has taken from us, 
which television and media and news has taken from us. We need to regain our true self. And that is that we're believers and sons of believers. And the benefit of belief, Rabbi Nachman says, is you're no longer limited to nature. You're no longer bound by the natural world. And the natural world is what causes suffering because the natural world is limiting. The natural world is taking your hope away. Believe in something greater. Believe in something higher. Believe in something limitless. Believe in Hashem. Believe in yourself. And the only way to do this is through Noah. The only way to do this is to get on that boat with the tzaddik. And then he'll feed you. And he'll nourish you. And he'll give you what you need during this exile. During this flood of atheism. And there's no other way to make it out. Because everybody else who was flooded in that time, they didn't make it. Just like in Moshe Rabbeinu's time, anyone who wasn't attached to Moshe didn't make it out of the Midbar. He didn't make it to Eretz Yisrael. We need to attach ourselves to the Tzaddik, not because it's some type of cult, chas v'shalom, not because we, are, um, we don't want to take responsibility for our own personal life. It's the opposite. We want to take as much responsibility for our life as possible. We want to increase the power of our souls to the greatest degree possible to make that positive change that we're all looking for, for geula, for redemption, for an uplift of a collective consciousness. And all of that begins and ends with attachment to the tzaddik, with attachment to the tzaddik of the generation, to the Moshe Rabbeinu, to the Noach of our times. This is Rabbi Nachman, and we need him now. And that's why Rabbi Nachman said at the end, everyone's going to need me. He wasn't being arrogant. He wasn't being foolish. He wasn't being grandiose. He's saying there's a reality. The reality is nature and science is about to sweep over the world. And the only hope you have is the tzaddik, is Noah, who he dismissed all of it and he got on the boat and he followed Hashem. And we need to hold on to that person, that he has complete conviction, that he has pure da'at, that he has not a shadow of a doubt in his mind, that everyone who's connected to him is fed and is happy, and is whole, and is progressing, and is hopeful. Bezvat Hashem, we should all have it, and um, and we should do our part to spread these teachings to everybody. You know, Tzion Breslov is not mine, and it's not the people who made it. This is for everybody. Rabbi Nachman's teachings are for everybody to study, and it's not a good thing, it's not a nice thing, it's necessary, because there's so many people who are suffering, and they're not suffering from the events in their life. They're suffering because we're sleeping. So everybody here needs to do our part this year, this year, right now. Go spread these teachings. Give these teachings over to others. If you feel like they have impacted you in a positive way, so give it out. You know, the whole difference between Noah and Abraham was that Noah didn't pray for his generation, and Abraham did. And then it says that even Abraham didn't reach the level of Moshe Rabbeinu because Abraham prayed for them. But Moshe Rabbeinu prayed and he had Mr. Nefesh for them. It was both. He was praying for them and he was mamish doing whatever he could to spread the light physically. So we have to do both. We need to look for what's lacking in the world, which is obviously these teachings. And we need to pray that they should be spread in the world. And then we have to go physically, press that button on our phones and give these teachings out. And don't be afraid of what people are going to say and how they're going to look at it. I can't tell you how many people that you would think on paper they're not going to connect to these teachings. They're not going to want something religious or spiritual. You would be shocked how a positive a reaction those same people have had to these classes, to these teachings. So really, we just got to get it out. Bezvet Hashem, we should be able to do it in a big way this year. Does anybody have any questions from today's class? Did anybody hear this class? I have a question. Go ahead, Ellie. How are you? Great, thank God. The sweet singer of Brooklyn. What's going on? Good. So here's the question. How does one know when they're using these teachings that they're not using it as a cop-out and they're really doing everything possible and not hiding behind being a Balamun or, or uh, not living in Teva because they don't want to really do anything? That you need people to do. And I know it's like the answer that I constantly give and people want a different answer, but I, I can't like sugarcoat it. There, there is no way to know what you're really thinking or feeling. If you don't have a time by yourself, away from society, away from pressure, away from technology, that you can actually say to Hashem out loud, Hashem, am I being honest? 
is this a Muna that I think that I'm applying or this a Muna that I think that I'm growing in? Am I really doing this because I just don't want to work? Or am I just doing this because I don't want to face the world? If that's the case, so then that's not the Amuna that Rabbi Nachum was speaking about. And, and you'll have to make some changes. But that's the only way. There's no, there's no other way to know. Um, you know, the Ramchal says very clearly, the beginning of a person rising the gate and the ladder of holiness, it begins with having a time on your own. And that's the beginning of closeness to Hashem. Because the truth is where Hashem is. And there's no way to access the truth without a settled mind. There's no way to have a settled mind, Rabbi Nachman says, without he voted you. So. And I have one more question. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, when someone's going through the dark times, what's the best way to go through it without resisting? Because typically you'll see it later on. How do you go through that tough time in the midst of it with, without the resistance and without the stress and without the anger? Right. So for this, you have to really work to internalize Rabbi Nachman's teachings, specifically on rising and falling, on running and returning. Um, he speaks about it in the first Torah. He speaks about it in the sixth Torah. It's actually a theme which is constantly coming up. And that is that, like Rabbi Nachman says in the sixth Torah, you need to be baki in halakha. He doesn't just mean that you need to become an expert in Jewish law. He means you need to know how to walk in life. You need to know how to deal with different circumstances and experiences that when you're feeling high and things are going great and you feel Hashem's hashkacha, and then that's handled in one way. But then when things are not going like that and it's dark and it's concealed and you don't see Hashem in your life and you're actually suffering, you're struggling. So he said, you can't handle it the same way. You need to do something completely different. And that is take your mind and literally throw it in a trash bin and light it up on fire. And rely on Amuna Peshuta only. Because right now you're in Mochin the Katn. And if you try and use your Mochin the Katn to get out of your situation, you're going to stay there longer. So what is the key right now? You need to put your mind in a womb which allows it to heal, which allows it to rest, which allows it to rejuvenate and become greater again. That womb is Amuna. So you need to stick your consciousness in Amuna and rely on Amuna only. And that's the way that you move beyond that place. To say to yourself out loud in your Ibodadu, this that I don't understand. Like, for instance, I'm having nightmares right now. They're horrifying. <laughs> really? Like the, yeah, the past few days, it's been like when I take a nap during the day at night, it's really, really scary. And it takes like hours for me to shake it. So like in the past, I might have like thought about it all day. Why am I having these dreams and what's going on? And like, what, uh, and I'm feeling down and maybe something's wrong and. I just, I say to Hashem, I to do right after I get up. I have no idea what's going on right now. This is very, very scary, but I don't know what's happening. And I need to believe like the Rebbe teaches us that this is mamish, the greatest thing that could possibly happening. And even though it's beyond my understanding, that's because you are, and that's fine. This is also for the good. Hashem, help me to move through this space and to handle it with Amuna, And then help me to move out of this space and to be able to run after you and to understand you more and more and more. So it's, it's, it's really about learning Rabbi Nachman's teachings every day without fail and bringing them into your heart. I, I can't tell you, it's, it sounds too simple, um, but the only difference between me now and me five years ago is that every single day I learn these teachings and I do it. I'm not the smartest person. I'm not the uh, most energized person. I don't have the greatest health in the world. My mind is not functioning on all cylinders. It hasn't for many years. But I, I literally, I, I, I cling to the Rebbe. I don't drop the Rebbe. I don't leave it for a day or for an hour or for a moment. Because I know that all the good in my life comes from this. And literally, as the days go by, you may not notice it. But you're becoming a Balamuna. You just handling your life in a completely different way and that's what's giving birth like um that's what's giving birth to all the good in your life and then all of a sudden people start coming up to you and they're having help from you but that help is not even me it's literally just what rabbi nachman says to do you know people had all these letters they wrote to rev natan i have an eye problem what am i going to do about this i have a financial issue what am i going to do about this my wife is crazy and i can't get a divorce what am i going to do about this and rev natan says over and over again. I don't know why you guys write me letters. Everything is in Rabbi Nachman's books. Just go pick up the books and learn them. I promise you, you're going to find the answer to your question. And we resist that because that sounds like it's too hard to believe or it sounds like that's not possible. But it is. 
And it's an amazing, amazing thing. It's in these books. And, and Bezrat Hashem, you know, we're teaching Likut Moran once a week, Likut Elachot now once a week. We're going to start doing Sikhot Aran, Bezrat Hashem tomorrow. Just tune into every class. And if you miss it, watch it on YouTube. You can't have a day that goes by in this world, in this time, without Rabbi Nachman. You will have a spiritual death. Good to see you. You too. I'll speak to you later. Okay, bye. Any other questions? No? Okay. Everybody have an amazing day. Bezrat Hashem tomorrow. We're going to do a first Sikhot Aran class. It should be really, really amazing. It's a much different Limud learning than Likut Elachot, which obviously is a much different learning than Likut Moran. But uh, it's just as necessary, and, uh, and I hope it's going to really, really help us in this battle. So everybody have an amazing day.